If you've clicked on this video and you think that Rob Bell in his book is only making questions, only questioning things, or if you believe that it's not right for somebody to judge him based on his book, or if you don't think that this is an important topic to discuss either way, then I recommend you check out my first video entitled, Should We Condemn Rob Bell? So this video is going to be basically a short review of the book Love Wins by Rob Bell and all the different controversial topics that have come up because of that. Um, people usually, when they want to defend Rob Bell, they'll have two different reasons why they think this book is still okay. First of all, they will see universalism in the book, but then they'll say that's just another interpretation of scripture. Being a universalist isn't wrong. It's a perfectly legit theology from the Bible. The second group doesn't want to admit that he's saying universalism in this book. Usually this is people that know their Bible, but also really like Rob Bell, and they don't want him to be a heretic. Now, the first accusation is that it says universalism in it, and on page 107, Love Wind says, At the heart of this perspective is the belief that, given enough time, everybody will turn to God and find themselves in the joy and peace of God's presence. The love of God will melt every hard heart, and even the most depraved sinners will eventually give up their resistance and turn to God. Now, it's very popular today to say, everybody ends up in heaven anyways. Most people that like this idea will go for love wins and will like it. Now, Rob Bell says that we should long for this, long for everybody to go to heaven. Now, I want to know what's the thing that he's saying we should long for? That everybody goes to heaven or that everybody finds salvation? There's a big difference there. We should long for something that God has told us to long for. God has told us to long for everybody getting saved, not just everybody going to heaven. Now, why does Rob Bell distance himself from the label of universalist? It's because he knows it's wrong. It's, it's been proven to be a heresy for a very long time. Now, the second claim is that Rob Bell doesn't believe in hell. Now, personally, I don't think that's really what he's saying, but on page 114 of Love Wins, he does say, People choose to live in their own hells all the time. We do it every time we isolate ourselves, give the cold shoulder to someone who has slighted us, Every time we hide knives in our words. Every time we harden our hearts in defiance of what we know to be the loving good and the right thing to do. Then on page 71 he says, Do I believe in a literal hell? Of course. Those aren't metaphorical missing arms and legs. Then on page 73 he says, Some destruction does make you think of fire. Some betrayal actually feels like you've got burned. Some injustices do cause things to heat up. Then he says that hell is the very real experiences and consequences of rejecting our God-given goodness and humanity. However, in other places, Rob Bell does seem to say that he believes in a little literal hell and that people will undergo some form of judgment. But the problem is, I don't see the two things going together. He, in, one, in one respect, he gives this figurative version of hell, and in another respect, he says he believes in a literal hell. And so it's like he's claiming two mutually exclusive things at the same time. Another issue that comes up a whole lot when people are discussing this is, is this a good book even though it's bad theology? The idea that it may be bad, it may be wrong, but it's brought about an interesting conversation. It gets people looking up the subject. It gets people reading their Bible. The problem is, I don't think people are going to start reading their Bibles because of this. They're just going to adopt it as an interesting idea. People aren't going to be looking into this. The people that are looking into it are already very much against it. People that like the idea are just going to accept it. Now, God can use evil for good, but that doesn't mean that an evil thing is itself good. So, in this situation, this is not a good thing that, it, that this book was written. It's raising up a generation that believes in subjective theology, that our theology is made up by us. Now, a major part in the book that I want to talk about is, does God get what God wants? It's a major part of his, of his book, a whole chapter is called that, and really it's an argument for universalism. On page 98, he says, Will all people be saved, or will God not get what he wants? Then on page 99, he goes on to say how many times in the Bible um, it says that everyone will be saved. Then he reiterates the point on page 100 and says, all people, all nations, every person, every knee, every tongue. In Matthew 23, 37, we can read, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says that God wants all of us to be sexually pure. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. 
Now, these are just two examples in the Bible where God doesn't get what God wants. The perspective of Rob Bell is God's all-powerful, God wants everybody to be saved, so obviously everybody's going to get saved. But here you can see this idea that there are things in the Bible that it says that God wants, but we don't necessarily get them. This is not because of a lack of power. This is because God has given us freedom. He doesn't force himself on us. Now, Bell does admit that God allows our freedom. But if that's the case, then what's the point of asking, does God get what God wants? And also, he, he asks this question in a way that will make the audience feel stupid if they have to say, no, he doesn't. On page 103, he says, Will God in the end settle saying, Well, I tried. I gave it my best shot. And sometimes you just have to be okay with failure. Will God shrug God's sized shoulders and say, You can't always get what you want? He's sarcastically saying, Either all get saved or God's failed. Now, another thing that I want to bring up from the book is that he says that we get other chances after death to accept Christ. Now, he does give scripture for this, and we're going to go into that in a bit. But first of all, on page 106 to 107, Rob Bell says, And then there are those others who ask, If you get another chance after you die, why limit that chance to a one-off immediately after death? And so they expand the possibilities, trusting that there will be endless opportunities in an endless amount of time for people to say yes to God, as long as it takes, in other words. Now, let me be clear about this. Nothing in the Bible says this. This is a made-up idea that he thought of that is comfortable. Nothing in the Bible says this. He, now, the, the biblical reference that he does give is from 1 Peter 3, verses 18 and 19. So let me read that for you. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And then the important part, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, this passage is vague. You, it's not necessarily meant for this idea that Jesus went into hell, preached to people, and brought and converted them to Christianity. If you read that into it, you're reading something into it that wasn't meant for that. If you read the whole book of First uh, Peter, that's not the point he's trying to get across with this scripture. It's possible, but that's not the point of it. Now, this is the best verse in the Bible for this opinion that we get numerous chances after death. There's nothing else that even comes close to it. And so, in this idea that we get other chances after death, that's the best verse, and it's vague, and wasn't originally written for that purpose? It's pretty sad to base a theology on that. And also, the Bible is very clear that this is the life where we make our decision. This is the life where the choice is made. Now, one opinion on this is that maybe God made us feel this way, that this is the life where we have to make the choice in order, to, in order to have us make better choices during this life, to love him during this life. Well, if it's true that the next life offers, op offers opportunities and this life isn't the place where we make the choice, then God making us feel like it's now or never is a lie, isn't it? On page 108, Bell asks if God honestly closes the door on people and says, Sorry, too late, door's locked. Sorry, if you had been here earlier, I could have done something, but now it's too late. Now, this idea is biblical. He makes it seem stupid, but it is biblical. Matthew 24 and 25 are a great place for this. If you want to read those two chapters, it'll give you a huge insight into it. And the only thing I really have to look at in this is the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. The story in, and really the whole chapter, is talking about this life being where we make our choice. People live their lives a certain way, and then they're judged. Half of the virgins make the right decision, and half of the virgins make the wrong decision. They come to the door of the house, and the person inside answers. Uh, they, they say to him, Lord, Lord, open to us. And the person inside says to them, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And at the point of this story, they, it says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. God is revealing himself as the idea that Rob Bell is mocking. Another place where Rob Bell tries to make scripture say that we get numerous opportunities after death is in Revelation 21 verses 25 to 27. Here we find that the gates of heaven don't close. The problem is, Bell leaves out the following verses. And it's where it says that certain people will not enter them. He, why would he leave that part out? It's the verse after. He obviously knows it's there. In Luke 16 verse 31, he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. 
The idea here is that people are so rebellious, they will not accept Christ. In order to bring up this idea that people might accept Christ at a later time, it's not biblical. Now, on this idea of evangelism and philanthropy that Rob Bell brings up, Bell says that evangelism is still important, even though everyone will eventually accept the message of Christ and be saved. Us telling them about Jesus isn't going to help them come to heaven because they will already go to heaven eventually. Us telling them about Jesus is just going to bring heaven to earth for them right now. Now, all he can really mean about this is that they'll have a better life right now. If we're going to be perfectly honest, what's going to make your life better right now? Not later, but right now. Food and water for your dying and starving children? Or hearing about what Jesus did for you? It's harsh, I know, but realistically, if we're not saving these people's souls, because they'll be saved eventually, we're just trying to help them live a better life, then doing acts of charity become better than evangelizing in this mindset. It's also funny, because while this seems very extreme, this seems to be the attitude that people are having nowadays. The gospel is rarely preached, but sermons on philanthropy and social justice are a dime a dozen. Now, a big part of this that I want to bring up is the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is trying to interpret the original intention of the Word of God. Eisegesis is figuring out your own idea and interpreting that into the Word of God. It's not just about different interpretations of the Bible. The Bible is not a subjective book where everybody brings their own interpretation. The Bible was written for a purpose in, that God had in mind. It has truth in it. It's not just whatever we can get from it is cool. Another point I wanted to bring up about this book is that its title is Love Wins. And the funny thing is, I don't feel that this book is very loving. On page 173, he says that while we're alive, God seeks us. Then right once we're dead, he tortures us in hell. He says that if our father God is like this, then he's a terrible father and deserves to have the cops called on him. If, and then he says, to quote him, if God can switch gears like that, switch entire modes of being that quickly, that raises a thousand questions about whether a being like this could ever be trusted, let alone be good. Considering what we read in Matthew 25, it does seem like God will punish those who rebel against him once they die. So I suppose the biblical father God deserves to have the cops called on him, in Rob Bell's opinion. On page 182, he says, Let's be very clear then. We do not need to be rescued from God. God is the one who rescues us from death, sin, and destruction. God is the rescuer. And then as the, as the idea for this God who we need rescuing from, he says, Have nothing to do with that God. On page 8 of the preface, Rob Bell comments on the select few of Christians going to heaven and the rest of the humanity going to hell. He says that this view is toxic. The God he's rebelling against is supported by the Bible, and he says, have nothing to do with this God. This God is toxic. On page 198, his, some of his final remarks, he says, love is why I've written this book, and love is what I want to leave you with. He calls my beliefs toxic, narrow-minded, devastating, psychologically crushing, and unbearable. That my concept of God's character is a God that isn't to be trusted, and that people shouldn't have anything to do with this God. He uses rhetorical questions and sarcastic and insulting remarks to make his point of view of just how stupid my doctrine is. And this is love. This is a book of love he wrote for me. Now, is the idea of eternal punishment in hell biblical? Personally, I like the idea of hell. I also like prisons. The biblical passage of an unloving God, these are a few of them. When Jesus was with the Pharisees in Luke 11, verses 37 to 45, he calls them wicked fools, and it shows an example that they were insulted by these things. In 2 Kings verses, chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, there's a story where kids get mauled by a bear. There's also the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, check out verse 24 specifically. Also, there was a global flood in Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 and 23 is a good example of it. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 to 17, he talks about slaughtering the nations, and this is in lots of other places too. These are ideas of God being unloving in Rob Bell's point of view, this toxic God that we should have nothing to do with. Also, there's passages in the Bible that talk about the separation of the saved and the unsaved. In Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15, it says that some are in the city and some are outside of the city. 
in Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14, it says that few will find heaven and that many will be destroyed. In Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23, some call on Jesus and are still damned. They go to hell to learn something, maybe go to purgatory, but it doesn't look like it. In Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, it says that Jesus will separate the weeds from the grain. And this is his idea of how hell works. This is why life is the way it is. And the weeds get burned. In Revelation 22, 11, it says that the righteous will be righteous and the wicked will be wicked. It does not say that the wicked will become righteous eventually. It seems to make a clear distinction between the people that will accept Christ and the people that will not accept Christ. There are also Bible passages on hell being eternal and being a place of punishment. In Matthew 16, verse 26, it says that um, you will lose your soul, and it doesn't seem to give the assumption that you will get it back. Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51, it says that if you aren't prepared, you will be punished. Is hell there to change their minds? Would they love Jesus after they're being tortured? I think that's a really strange idea to say that we go to hell and are tortured for a while and somehow we come to love Jesus Christ, the one that put us there. Now, I know that at least one person is condemned for all of eternity in the sense that they will never be redeemed from it because Jesus spoke of the unpardonable sin. In Matthew 12, verse 32, it says that there is an unpardonable sin. And it doesn't matter what our opinion is of what this sin is. That can be different. The point is, there's an unpardonable sin, and at least one person is going to be judged for an infinite amount of time. He's not forgiven. Also, about whether hell is eternal. Rob Bell talks about the word aeon as being just a period of time of correction. It's not corrective. Hell is not a place for correction. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, it says, Indeed, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to those who are afflicted, as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, there's another passage that talks about the, the word for duration of this being the word aeon, and it gives the word for heaven as well as hell. It's Revelation 22.5. It says that the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. The same terminology is used there that is used in other places for hell. So the idea here is, if hell isn't eternal and it uses the words forever and ever, then I guess heaven isn't eternal because it uses the same words. Now, the terminology here is actually aeonis aeonon. Now, I might be pronouncing that wrong, I'm not a Greek scholar, but it's the same term for hell that Rob Bell uses to try to explain away. There's also a passage in, in Matthew 25, 46, that uses it in both contexts in the same verse. It says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, here you find heaven and hell in the same verse with the same words being applied to the duration. It's very hard to say, well, one of those terms means a little bit of time and the other one means an actual infinity amount of time. Now, a major thing that people bring up is whether or not there should be an infinite punishment for a finite sin. Now, first of all, I'd like to bring up this idea of a finite sin. We're sinning against God. The one who created us, we are rebelling against this God and telling him we don't want anything to do with him. Personally, I don't consider that a finite sin. I don't think the sin that we're looking at here is, oh, I stole one time. It's a rebellion against Christ. And also, I would like to point out this. When we're in hell, do you really think we stop sinning? When we're in hell, I think it would be perfectly logical to say that we continue sinning perpetually forever. And that this would perpetually damn us and give us God even more reasons to keep us in hell. Now, I'd like to bring up the point, what if Rob Bell's wrong? What if this life matters? Many people, if they believe this idea of Rob Bell, will have a false hope that they can make the decision in the next life. And they can go on sinning in this life and re reject Christ. And realistically, for the atheist or the other religious person, they don't even have to consider Christianity if they get a choice in the afterlife. Salvation is not based on the actions that you do. It's also not based on something you believe. It's based on a submission and a reliance on Jesus Christ as your Savior from your own sin. 
Love does, in fact, win because the love of Jesus Christ is what saves us from our sin. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God gave us the blessing of faith. We're privileged to have it, and we are, uh, we are privileged to not be forced into submission. The fear of punishment isn't love. Choosing Jesus when we're in hell wouldn't be because of our love for him. The only reason you would accept Jesus in hell is because of a fear of punishment. God will not allow people into heaven if they have sin, because then there would be evil and suffering in heaven, and heaven would cease to be heaven. God loves us, and he wants to, us to come to him. He, he has gone to great lengths to save us by becoming man, dying a painful death for us, and then taking on sin when he was holy. His love for us does win over the powers of sin and death, but love does not force itself on the recipient of the love. He still gov gives us the choice, and sadly, many people will choose to rebel against God's love and will face the punishment of their actions. Now, I want to recommend a book for you. It's called Erasing Hell by Francis Chan. It deals with a lot of this topic matter and a whole lot more. It's very interesting, and it deals with a lot of the topics in Love Wins. It's very inexpensive, and it's a really short read as well, and it's written very well in a conversational manner and is very easy to read. I really recommend it if you want to look into this topic. If you still believe in Love Wins and you believe it's a great book, please read this book. It's short and very inexpensive. Also, I'd like to advertise my next video. It's going to be on Rob, Rob Bell's version of salvation. A lot of people are attacking him, saying that he's not even a Christian, and that, in fact, he's going to be going to hell himself. So I want to talk about this and where people get these ideas from. So that'll be uh, coming out pretty soon. Also, you can subscribe to my videos to get them right when they come out. So you'll be notified right when the video on Rob Bell's Salvation comes out and when my future videos comes out, like a documentary um, involving atheism and Christianity and also a documentary I'm making on my trip to Israel.